everybody, this is Dave Dugdale, learningdslorevideo.com. Today, I'm reviewing the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera. There's a lot of excitement about this camera. Um, basically, there's three things that I was most excited about before I even got it. One is the high dynamic range, two, really good Kodak, and three, a price for less than $1,000. Now, a lot of you might be saying, I've never heard of this company, Blackmagic Design, before. Where'd they come from? Well, there's a good reason. They just started shipping their first camera probably less than a year ago, and now they've got three different models. All right, I've been to a couple different trade shows, and I've gotten the opportunity to talk with Blackmagic, and while they won't really come out and say it, you could definitely tell they're really frustrated with Canon. They're like, come on, make better cameras. Blackmagic makes products for post-production, which is a really important note to remember because this camera requires a lot of work in post. Blackmagic is relatively small when you compare them to Canon, but what they lack in size, they make up for with guts because they are a disruptive company, and which is great for us. And think of Canon as being very conservative. They kind of give us what they want on their schedule. Now remember this camera is designed for post-production because of Blackmagic's background. You might be thinking to yourself, Dave, I see you're comparing these two cameras side by side and the pocket camera looks atrocious. It's got no, no color, it's desaturated, and it's just flat. And the 5D looks so good because it has all these, this color. And you are totally right. Remember, this camera is designed for you to do a lot of work in post to make it look good. And here I'm going to switch to after I've color graded the pocket camera and you can see the comparison of the two cameras right now. Let me start off by saying I really don't have enough experience to really do a proper review on this camera. Why? Because I'm not a professional colorist and I don't work on log images on a daily basis and correct them and grade them. But I can give you a lot of insight to what this camera's like for a person at my level. So if you're coming from a DSLR wanting to somewhat graduate into a camera like this, I think this review will definitely help you. I've learned a lot from this camera in the last 30 days. The stuff that I shot about a month ago, I've since regraded with much better results. I think this camera is really important. I think this is where camera technology is heading, where you capture an image, but which is only half the job, and then the other half of the job, you pretty much have to do in post. So I think you guys need to invest in yourself like I am taking advanced color grading courses, because I think at $1,000, shooting at this Kodak with this type of log image is like the camera to learn on. I've been testing this camera a lot against my 5D Mark III. The 5D creates wonderful images right out of the camera, whereas the pocket camera, I'd say maybe 50% of the time I'm really frustrated because I can't get the image I want that's similar to the 5D in terms of color. But when I do get it, the image just looks wonderful coming from the pocket camera. Why is this? It's not the camera's fault, it's just that I'm not an advanced colorist. The 5D has spoiled me. I can usually get a wonderful image with minimal color correction. The pocket camera on the other hand, especially in log mode, requires a lot of work. Now, I understand the basics of color correction in terms of neutral, pro-lost, cine style, and setting your white and black points and adding saturation and stuff like that, but when it comes to log mode, I'm finding it to be a totally different animal. For instance, using DaVinci Resolve, and you've got several nodes, which node do you put the LUT into? Let me give you an example. Here I'm shooting a sunset, and I shot it with the 5D and the pocket camera. The 5D gave me wonderful colors right off the bat, whereas you know, the pocket camera, where are the colors? I can't see them. So the problem becomes if I hadn't had my camera there and maybe I, maybe days later, I'm looking at that shot and like, well, there's not much to that sunset. I'm not gonna really use that shot, but the colors are there. And the question is, what colors are they and how do I pull them out? It's not as easy as just pumping up the saturation. Here, I'll show you. I'll pump up the saturation on this particular node and it pretty much doesn't do anything. So you have to add more nodes and you have to add LUTs and there's a lot of things to get your head around with this camera. And <laughs> so with that warning out of the way, what do I think of this camera? I think it creates an amazing image, especially on the resolution side, the amount of detail that you get out of the image. I'm not talking so much about sharpness, I'm talking about just detail that you can see. Especially when you compare it to my 5D Mark III, the 5D just looks kind of mushy and soft. Look at this shot, especially look at her eyelashes. Look at her pores, and definitely look at her hair. There's just so much more detail there than my 5D Mark III. 
I really like the detail you can get in the shadows with the pocket camera. You have this really nice smooth gradient between pure black and some darker tones. With my 5D Mark III, unfortunately, it kind of crushes the blacks at a certain point and they get kind of mushy and blocky and it's really hard to get that nice gradient when you're post-processing later. I'm somewhat new to this ProRes Kodak since I'm a Windows user, but I'm starting to like it. It's about four times larger than my 5D file sizes, but when you're playing them back in DaVinci Resolve, you get fewer drop frames, which is a really good thing. I've done several tests on this particular Kodak. One of the tests I did is I exposed the doll correctly on the right hand side and the left side I am underexposed two stops. And to my surprise, both cameras did really well. I shared this on the forums and people came back and said, you really need to go much farther than two stops. So what I did is I created this high dynamic range scene where I exposed for the highlights in the windows. And then what I did in post is I brought up the midtones and the highlights the exact same amount for both cameras. And as you can see, the pocket camera that uses ProRes um, handled that you know, punishment and post much better than my 5D Mark III did. All right, I'm not a green screen expert. I've done green screen over the years, but I was really surprised by the next test. ProRes with the pocket camera shoots is 422, Canon shoots 420. If you don't know what those numbers mean, basically the pocket camera should win this test hands down. But I was really surprised. Um, I didn't see it when I was keying these two. Um, they were pretty much the same. So again, I'm not an expert here, so I might have done something wrong. I met up with my friend James Drake and we compared the pocket camera to his Red Epic. We were looking for mostly high dynamic range shots to see how well the pocket camera did compared to the Red Epic. As you can see in this shot, especially in the highlights in the background, you can see that the Red Epic had more dynamic range than the pocket camera, but it wasn't a ton. And James pointed out that, you know, matching up this camera to his Red Epic wouldn't be that hard at all. Now I know it sounds kind of obvious and we were shooting in 5K with the Red Epic. The Red Epic had a lot more detail than this camera. So the 5D Mark III, then you've got this camera, then the Red Epic definitely wins. But as James told me, to kind of put things in perspective, the rental fee for Red Epic is the same amount of money as it would cost to buy this camera. I ran some aliasing tests with the pocket camera. Usually the Canon cameras, not the 5D Mark III so much, um, but the other Canon cameras will create a lot of aliasing on this power line. But the pocket camera did really well resolving the power line in this image. Also, I did some moray tests on this roof and usually the Rebel line of cameras will, uh, the roof tiles will be dancing all over the place. But the pocket camera did great. That being said though, I did find at least one shot where I did find some bricks behind me in the shot where it was kind of dancing around with more A patterns. The 5D Mark III can create a very shallow depth of field. This camera, not so much. You can kind of get around it, but for me, it's not that big of a deal because if I were to use this as a B camera, there's some instances where I'm not really looking for a camera where I have a very blurry background. Sometimes I just want to keep everything in focus. So this camera might be a great tool for that. Rolling shutter. I really didn't test it that much because from what I could see, it was very similar to my 5D Mark III and even my iPhone. They're all about the same. They all about skew just about the same. So I really didn't test it that much. So remember I said that for me, about 50% of the time, it's really hard to grade the image. Sometimes I can get it right, but sometimes it takes a long time. For instance, this shot, I tried maybe twice to get it to where I want it to be, and it took maybe 30 minutes. And I thought to myself, what kind of a professional colorist do to this image? So I asked my friend Juan Salvo if he would take a look at it, and I think he said it only took him about two minutes. And as you can see, his version is clearly better than mine, and he did it way faster. So let's say you're more advanced at color than I am and you're ready to get this camera now. Let me point out a few issues the camera definitely has. And as I'm going through this list and you might think I'm hating on the camera, I wanna put the price tag down below me just so you remember to glance over it every once in a while while I'm running through this list that it's only $995. And as with every review that I do, just to let you know, I have no affiliation with any companies like Blackmagic. I get my cameras from B&H, they don't tell me what to review, and they don't tell me what to say. All right, first off, I'm not gonna talk about the white orb or the black dot issue. If you don't know what these are, that's okay. They pretty much have fixed all these issues already, which is great. I'm glad that they're, you know, getting in there and fixing problems as fast as they can. 
The biggest issue that bothers me about this camera is not the batteries. It's actually the white balance or lack of white balance control. On my 5D Mark III, I get to dial in the Kelvin in really small increments and I can dial it into taste in real time. With the pocket camera, you have no real time way to see it on the screen. You have to leave the screen, go to the menu, come back to the screen to make some sort of decision. And then the other thing is you got these large chunks. Like the 5D Mark III have these very fine increments of white balance, whereas with the pocket camera, you go from like 5K to 5600. There's not much in between. So what I also like to see is have a custom white balance. So not only are we setting the Kelvin, but we're setting the green to magenta shift as well. The next thing that bothers me about this camera is the lack of tools we get for setting exposure. We basically get three things. The first thing is the auto iris button. It only works in video mode. It doesn't work in film mode whatsoever. The next thing is zebras, which is great for protecting highlights. And the last is actually just looking at the screen itself, which is hard to do. Even when you have the display mode set to video and you go into film mode um, for your actual shooting, it's hard to make those decisions with that really desaturated flat image. So the next thing I wanted to do is find out where do I set my 18% gray card for the waveform within my computer, because we don't have waveforms on the pocket camera, to find out where I need to set the exposure. And I asked um, Blackmagic for log mode or film mode, and they came back and they said 50 on the uh, waveform monitor, which I was kind of surprised with because other manufacturers like uh, Canon, who have developed white papers, have said 32 for some of their Canon cameras in log mode, and other manufacturers say around 40, so I was kind of surprised it was as high as 50. All right, this next issue might be totally isolated just to me and the lenses I was using, but I was having trouble focusing on an alarming number of shots. Take, for instance, this lizard, for example. As you can see, the 5D Mark III, nailed it. Pocket camera, soft. Um, which is odd because I was indoors so I could see the screen really well. I was manually focusing and I was zooming in digitally, 1x. With the 5D Mark III, we got 5 and 10x. So it's really easy to nail the focus on the 5D Mark III. Um, for instance, this shot right here outside, I shot at 12 millimeters at f22. It just looked kind of soft. The next issue for me is you can't shoot at 60 frames per second. So you can't get silky smooth slow motion. So, which is really odd because the GoPro shoots at 120 frames per second, no problem. My brand new iPhone shoots at 120 frames per second. And these devices cost less than this camera. Why can't we get uh, high frame rates in some of these smaller cameras? It just doesn't quite make sense. The batteries are kind of an issue since they don't last that long. You pretty much just have to buy five, seven of them. And luckily they're really small and you can just kind of carry them in your pocket. But as Andrew Reed kind of pointed out, he said, I bet you pretty soon we're gonna see a battery grip that'll go into the bottom of the camera, just slide right in like a DSLR, and that'll solve a lot of our issues. The pocket camera does have some audio issues. At least the unit that I have exhibits this kind of high frequency twirl type sound when you record using the internal microphone. When you use an external microphone, it seems to work just fine. One of the things that's nice about this camera that Canon's been stingy on, especially in this price range, um, is a headphone jack. And the pocket camera, we have one, which is awesome. So quickly, here's a few items, while not minor, I'm kind of hoping they're gonna fix in a future firmware update, such as being able to format the card within camera, being able to delete files in the camera, assigning the left and right arrow buttons to ISO or white balance so you can see those changes in real time. Being able to have audio meters, being able to find out how much time is left on the card, and also being able to remember settings when you turn the camera off and turn it on, such as your aperture. Um, just remember simple settings like that so you can begin shooting again right away. All right, now wouldn't this be cool? Here's an idea for Blackmagic, and I know they're watching this video. What if they took the source code to this camera and gave it away to the open source community? And communities like Magic Lantern, if you just have a go at it and they could just create waveform monitors and audio meters and all sorts of stuff that they're giving us on the Canon cameras, but they could, you know, they could actually work with Magic Lantern. You know, they both have the word magic in it. You got Magic Lantern, you got Black Magic. They should come together and they should work together. And Black Magic say, here's our code. We just released a new version, go for it. And you know, Magic Lantern's like, all right, here we go. I think that would be a match made in heaven. It would be awesome stuff. 
All right, speaking of Magic Lantern, you guys are probably wondering how does the 5D Mark III shooting Magic Lantern raw compare to the pocket camera? Um, I didn't want to spend too much time on this because I want to do another review of the pocket camera once the raw version comes out. But pretty much the amount of resolution and detail are about the same, but I'd probably give a win to the dynamic range on the 5D Mark III Magic Lantern RAW. All right, next up is construction on this camera. It's surprisingly good for them. This is only really their second camera. Um, it's not bad at all. If I were to be nitpicky, which <laughs> I guess I'll go ahead and do, um, this door I don't like very much the way it closes. Um, I would love to see the record button not to be on top, but be on the back because it just feels better for my finger to do it that way than doing it this way. Um, and then in terms of if you live in a wet environment or you're out in the rain a lot, um, yeah, it's not going to work too well in a wet environment. There's nothing to really protect it. So definitely keep that in mind. So who is this camera for? It's for somebody that really doesn't mind pushing around the image in post. It's perfect for somebody that wants to do a lot of green screen work. It's for a person that wants a good shot without permission or a permit, like sneaking into an art museum. It's for a person that doesn't mind spending a lot of time in post. It's for a person like me who's not really good at grading log images yet, but wants to grow into the camera. So who is this camera not good for? It's definitely not good for people that want a fast turnaround time. It's not for somebody that wants to learn a new skill such as grading a log image. It's not for somebody that wants to carry around one camera and take pictures too. It's not really good for intermixing DSLR footage if you're not good at grading the image like me. I'll admit it, it's really tough to match the skin tones from the DSLR to this particular camera. So before my conclusion, I need to thank several people that made this video possible because of my lack of experience. I asked a lot of people different questions. Uh, first up is definitely James Drake for helping me test, you know, against his Red Epic. Juan Salvo helping out with color and many other things. Terry, who I think is a director of marketing for Black Magic, definitely helped me out. He answered a lot of my questions. Some of them he didn't answer, but that was okay. I totally understood. Ryan Walters answering questions that I had about exposure for log footage and light meters. Jem Schofield helping me out with log as well. Uh, Andrew Reed for helping me pick out some micro four third glass. Alex McLean for helping me out with log as well. Uh, Caleb Pike for sharing his notes on his review of the Black Magic pocket camera. Matthew Scott for ideas on how to test it, and Scott, who had a Skype call with, helped me out with Resolve. I think you should be really excited about this camera, even if you're not gonna buy it, because Blackmagic is pretty much forcing conservative Canon to be more innovative and give us the stuff that we want now. Really, Canon's point and shoot market is dying off, and their DSLR market is probably their bread and butter. So they really do need us filmmakers. Bang for your buck, this camera is amazing. Nothing else comes close to it for dynamic range and the level of detail that you get. If you want to help support what I do here, making these video reviews that do take a lot of time, definitely check out the link below. If you're interested in buying it, that'll take you to B&H. It doesn't cost you anything extra. Also, definitely check out my in-depth courses I have for DSLR cameras. All right, so I know I've said this camera can be quite frustrating, and it is, but I'm not giving up on it. I'm gonna take some advanced courses. I'm gonna get better at color grading. If you haven't done so, definitely check out Zakudo's shootout they did about a year ago where they made an iPhone look pretty comparable to a Red Epic. So this camera gets you there about 50% of the way once you've hit record again and you stop recording. You've got to take it into your nonlinear editor, DaVinci Resolve, speed grade, whatever you use, and you pretty much have to come up with the other 50%. So that's pretty much it. I hope that helps. I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.